Hey everybody, Brando Coot here, and yes, just in time for Halloween, Brando Reads is back. Once again, I'm getting a story off the subreddit R No Sleep. This one comes to us from Demons Dance Alone, and it's called Chuck Came Back Wrong. I will leave a link in the description below, so read along with me if you want to. We're going to jump right in to Chuck Came Back Wrong. I pushed Chuck Parker into a well and stayed there, watching him until he went down and didn't come up again. When I told his mother, she thanked me and gave me a hug. Did I know Chuck before this? Kinda sorta. He was just part of the flock of neighborhood kids that hung out together. We weren't old enough to self-segregate, so everybody was sort of a friend to everybody. If I think real hard, I think maybe I can pick his face out of certain memories here or there. I don't know if he's the one who yelled run that day. It could have been anyone. My mind didn't bother to note the voice. I thought it was all part of some new game at Jungle City. At that age, we had already decided that new buildings were a bore. When they rotted or got torn down, there was only a jumble of paper-thin drywall. When old buildings went, they created ruins. The Henley Gasworks had a crumbling brick foundation overgrown with pokeberries and weed pecans. It was our Jungle City. There, we played updated games of tag and hide-and-seek, ducking jungle beasts and witch doctors. We had just come off a game of magic tag when the scream came. Did we all recognize the urgency in the voice, or did we write it off as another facet of the great game? The voice told us to run. Don't ask. Just go now. We went. Skipping and laughing, we ran from the building. No one noticed Chuck was left behind until we hit Grand Street and the beginnings of civilization again. Hadn't he been the one who yelled? But then, why hadn't he been first out the building? Michelle had seen him sitting on the edge of the hole, rotted through to the water-filled basement, got distracted by the tag game long before the scream. When we got to the war monument that guarded the entrance to our street, Chuck was already there. None of us were alarmed, it was only natural that Chuck had gotten there first. Perhaps he had ducked out before us without being seen, but gradually, as we talked to him, it began to dawn on us that something was wrong. The smell hit you first. The whole time Chuck was around, you would always smell this meaty, fruity odor rolling off him in waves. Our teacher had to open the windows of the classroom on the days he actually bothered to show up, and it only got worse the longer he was around. Like, whatever it was started putrefying. Chuck was all damp. He lounged in the lap of the monument like a king on a throne, smiling with confidence beyond his years. We greeted him, laughing about how he had beat us there. Chuck didn't say anything to us that first afternoon, which probably would have tipped us off earlier on that something wasn't right. He just slid off the monument like he was rainwater and walked behind the group. We plugged our noses and joked about him falling in sewer water. When we went our separate ways, Chuck tried to follow Kelly until we reminded him that he didn't live close to her. Ben volunteered to get him home. I think he was a little concerned about the way Chuck didn't appear to have a sense of direction. The next morning, her mom spent 20 minutes on the phone, and when she hung up, she told me we weren't allowed to go back to the gasworks building. Chuck had fallen into something bad, and it made him sick. I couldn't ever go back. Was that clear? I whined at first, but after a weird shift started happening, I was only too glad to sit away from that place. Maybe Chuck had fallen into something bad, but Chuck wasn't sick. Chuck wasn't Chuck, and we realized this over the course of the next few days. Phil was jumping off this ledge of the quarry with a few of the guys. We called it the Death Cliff, but it couldn't have been more than seven feet off the ground. Phil said Chuck was quiet, like he'd been since the gas works, until it came his turn to jump. Chuck walked to the edge and just looked down, like he didn't know what to do. Phil yelled go. The others yelled go, and Chuck stepped off the edge. Phil was a solid kid, always had your back in a fight, so when he said Chuck's knees bent backwards when he landed, I believed him. Phil said it wasn't a regular hyperextension either. Chuck nearly bent in half the wrong way. Then, slowly, he stood up straight with a little smile on his face. The others climbed off the rock, asking if he needed to go to the hospital. Chuck said no. 
and they realized why he hadn't said anything before. His voice, when he spoke, sounded too thick and deep, like something trying to imitate a kid with adult vocal cords. Anne was kind of the class blabbermouth, so when she said she saw Chuck take a bite out of a dead kitten, I was less inclined to believe her. She said that she'd been walking home on a street near our neighborhood, and she saw Chuck crouching down by a little furry shape. She watched him poke at it curiously, then his head went down and she heard the crunch. Chuck came up, mouth slick with red, chewing like an iguana chomping on lettuce. She was too scared to cry. She said she couldn't tell if the body was just wingling under the force of his assault, or if a kitten was still alive when he started. When I met Chuck later that day, his breath smelled like death. I was a little kinder to Anne after that. I wasn't in the lunchroom when he spat in Kevin's milk, but plenty of other people were. They told me of how he waited till Kevin's back was turned and put his mouth over the carton. They said it wasn't just a little stream of spit. An endless yellow drool fell from his mouth into the milk. He ended it just before Kevin turned around. He smiled and pushed Kevin's tray forward. Kevin took it and got away quickly from Chuck's smell. Someone accidentally on purpose ran into Kevin, splattering the suddenly thick milk everywhere. In addition to these events, there were all the little things we noticed day by day. How Chuck was always a little damp. How the smell evolved over time. How the whites of his eyes had a bluish tint. How his chin started sprouting these long, pale hairs. He was a brunette. How he moved strangely, nodding his head when no one had said anything. Reggie nudged me one day, pointing in silent terror to the back of Chuck's head. Chuck was talking to Ben, back to us. As he spoke, I watched the back of his head flex and bulge, like his jawbones extended behind his skull. It was almost two weeks after Chuck came back wrong that I ran into his mother. I was walking to the school bus and I saw her car parked at the end of the alley. She was a mess. She looked like she hadn't showered or slept since Chuck got back. She motioned for me to come over, so I got in the car. When she spoke, her voice was just... dead. I had never before seen someone so deeply in despair they couldn't show emotion. Chuck's mom asked me how I was, and I said fine. She asked how well I knew Chuck, and I said well enough. Chuck's mom said that Chuck wasn't her son anymore. She just knew, and I probably knew too. Chuck didn't know things he should have known. He didn't ever eat what she cooked for him. I didn't tell her about the kitten. And he wouldn't bathe. She tried to put him in the shower, and he bit her. He left teeth in her skin when he did that. She found loose teeth all over the house more than should have been in his mouth. She said she didn't know what to do. She wanted to know what had made him this way. I told her my best guess. I know what it sounds like now, a childhood flight of fancy, but she didn't laugh or berate me for making up stories. She gave me a limp hug and thanked me, and told me to stay away from him until we could figure out what to do. She dropped me off at school because we'd been talking too long and I missed the bus. I didn't make it to class that morning either. As she drove away, I saw something at the far end of the baseball diamond. It looked like Chuck, and he had someone small by the hand. I thought a lot about what I did that day. Why I didn't run and grab a teacher, call the cops, tell someone. It's because I knew, even then, that it would be too slow. And I knew whatever he was up to had to be stopped. Quick. I caught up with them way outside the school because I didn't want to attract too much attention. Michelle's little sister Tammy was holding Chuck's hand. She was clearly revolted by his smell, but he was promising her a lot of things as he led her away. His thick voice like wasp honey. I called for him to stop. Chuck turned around weird. Parts of his body moved that shouldn't have. And that yellow drool was leaking from his mouth and eyes. I had
have to wonder what he promised her to make her overlook his appearance. I asked what he was doing. Chuck laughed. Tammy was starting to breathe fast. I think it only hit her that something was wrong when someone else showed up. She started twisting her hand, but Chuck wouldn't let go. I asked if he was showing her something, because I wanted to see it. Chuck blinked. That goop in his eyes pulled into little threads. I told him to let go of Tammy and show me. He did. Tammy ran, sobbing, and I told him to lead on. I knew he was leading us to the gas works long before he turned onto the factory district. I don't know what made me think of the well. Maybe it was Chuck's mom mentioning he didn't like water? I told him we needed to stop at this cracked concrete circle. I had something I wanted to show him too. He stopped, looking at me oddly. The concrete had broken away. Not big enough to call for expensive repairs, but big enough to fall in. I called him closer. Closer. The real Chuck would have known what the hole was. This Chuck bent down, and I pushed him in. He didn't fall right in. He was too big, caught on the edge. I had to stomp on his back to get him in there. He made too big of a splash. I watched through the crack. Chuck was screaming at me in a voice that didn't sound even human anymore. He kept trying to climb up the sides and falling back down like an ant in a pitcher plant. He took forever to go under. I walked home after I was sure he was dead. I went to Chuck's house first. His mom gave me a hug, told me what to say when they questioned me. Chuck had tried to run away. I followed him to keep him safe. I lost him. Everyone accepted it. Chuck had been acting strangely. It wasn't outside the realms of possibility. Tammy never spoke up either. I think she realized how close she came to danger. Either that or she blocked it out. I wish I could block it out. The sight of Chuck clawing at the sides of the well, arms and legs rotating as if every joint was a ball and socket. Not once have I ever regretted doing it, though. I still have to wonder whether Chuck is really dead in there. Whether something had changed him, or just replaced him. And it haunts me to wonder what the hell he told us to run away from that first day at the gasworks. <laughs>